What's good? It's Woog. I wanted to talk a moment about the announcement from a few days ago that Anthony Joshua is going to be fighting Francis Ngannou, former UFC champion who exceeded expectations to a huge degree in his very competitive and razor close fight with Tyson Fury, where Ngannou dropped Fury in the third round after being super competitive in the first two rounds. One of the most shocking moments, if not the most shocking moment of 2023. And many were wondering, so where does Francis go from there? He's 0-1 technically as a boxer, but it was it was that performance against, you know, lineal champ, longtime WBC champ, former IBF, WBA, WBO champ, Tyson Fury. Francis Ngannou just blew people's minds with not only the knockdown, but it was it was as shocking, well, nearly as shocking when he was fighting the other even competitive rounds outside of the round with the knockdown to me that was as shocking because even when fury got floored i'm thinking okay he's gonna get up and handle business right and then you see fury switching to southpaw switching back to orthodox just having all kinds of trouble trying to figure francis and ganu out so they announced Joshua versus Ngannou for March 8th in Saudi Arabia. And I assume that the undercard is probably going to be stacked too. I saw, you know, some uh, rumors that they were trying to get, or Joseph Parker was trying to get either Philip Ergovich or Zhili Zhang in the ring with them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this March 8th Saudi Arabia card. But again, after the Ngannou versus Fury fight or Fury versus Ngannou fight, people were thinking, well, where does Ngannou go from there? Because He's got a hot hand, right? And I'm thinking, well, he doesn't go back to the PFL. Like, who's the PFL doesn't have any great heavyweights to offer him. Like, who's he going to fight? Like, a Ryan Bader or somebody of that caliber, that name stature? So, unless John Jones was going to somehow get out of his UFC contract, go over to PFL to fight Francis Ngannou, I'm thinking, does Francis Ngannou ever fight MMA again after getting that payday in the boxing ring? And having that overall experience, does he go back to MMA at 37 years old? And keep in mind, Francis Ngannou's first love in the combat sports game was boxing. He just, it just so happened that his path ended up landing him an MMA career. But Francis Ngannou at, at heart loves boxing. So I don't see somebody at 30 something, late 30s, get back into the cage and I don't know, suffer leg kicks. Why go through leg kicks if you don't have to, especially again with late 30s legs? So on the Anthony Joshua side, it was supposed to be Anthony Joshua versus Deontay Wilder, assuming Joshua handled business against Otto Valin, which he did and looked spectacular. One of the best performances I've ever seen from Anthony Joshua. And if Deontay Wilder handled business against Joseph Parker, he did not. So with Deontay Wilder essentially fumbling that opportunity, and I know a lot of people are saying, well, Joshua never wanted to fight Deontay Wilder. And other people saying, well, Deontay Wilder has no one to blame but himself. Okay, the fight's not going to happen because, uh, you know, many wonder whether Deontay Wilder is still even a viable elite, near elite heavyweight, given that performance against jo Joseph Parker. We don't even know. I don't know if he's got the appetite for destruction in the way that he did. He said that he didn't after his ayahuasca experiences and so forth. So Eddie Hearn, Anthony Joshua's matchroom promoter, was basically floating out a few a few names as Joshua's next possible opponent. He was talking about Philip Ergovich. He was talking about Zhili Zhang. He was talking about Francis Ngannou and maybe an outside chance that they run it back between Joshua and Joseph Parker. You know, Anthony Joshua fought that title unification fight back in 2018 and became the first person to beat Joseph Parker. Joseph Parker became the first person to take Anthony Joshua the distance. So it was an outside possibility that maybe Joshua and Parker run it back. But we now have our answer. And Eddie Hearn made it clear after that Fury versus Ngannou fight that he was interested in getting in on Francis Ngannou and becoming a part of that. And Eddie Hearn at first was just totally dismissing the notion that Francis Ngannou was like a worthy opponent of Anthony Joshua. But after that performance, Eddie Hearn did a full 180 essentially and said, oh, Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou would be massive. It would be massive. Like all of a sudden he's throwing his name in the hat on the Francis Ngannou sweepstakes for lack of a better term. I know Anthony Joshua is going to be the A side 
of this fight. But let's be clear, this is going to be a huge fight. Even if you look at it as a novelty fight or a gimmick fight, it's going to be a big, big fight, right? And by the way, I'm wearing this Fela Kuti t-shirt. Uh, Fela Kuti is a famous uh, activist, musician, band leader, uh, saxophonist from Nigeria in the 70s. Very um, politically driven, uh, very, just a very large figure. Look, at, look up Fela Kuti. But Anthony Joshua is of Nigerian heritage. I know he's born and raised in the United Kingdom in England. But he is of Nigerian descent, and Francis Ngannou is from Cameroon. Cameroon is right next to Nigeria, so I just thought that the Fela shirt was appropriate. And I will do a full preview as we near the fight date, but let's just ask ourselves, how real of a shot does Francis Ngannou have? And I feel like the answer to that question, just probability-wise, it lies in whether you think that Fury versus Ngannou was more... Fury being underprepared and not as good as he should have been, or if Francis Ngannou is the story and that he's far better than anyone could have imagined in the boxing ring. We knew he was a devastating striker, especially by MMA standards. He might be the hardest striker in MMA history. It's a short list, pound for pound. It's like him, Anthony Rumble Johnson, and maybe a couple of others. But, you know, Francis Ngannou... I can't think of anybody off the top of my head who's got a harder punch per punch than Francis Ngannou in UFC or MMA history. But the idea was that Tyson Fury was the elite future Hall of Fame boxer who had developed these skills over the years and was just going to put them on display and make Francis Ngannou look like a total amateur outside of his depths and that Ngannou was just going to get beaten and worked and probably stopped by Tyson Fury. I mean, I was looking at it as Francis Ngannou, if he goes the distance, that's a victory for Francis Ngannou. Well, he ended up doing a hell of a lot more than that. You know what I mean? And so the boxing world, first of all, everybody in the boxing community had to have been like, whew, because if Francis Ngannou were to have pull off the upset, boxing fans from MMA fans, and I, I am both. I, I love boxing. I love MMA. I've been watching the UFC since like UFC 2, UFC 3. I'm talking Hoist Gracie versus Chemo. And the days of, you know, Dan the B Severn and, you know, Paul Varlins and Ken Shamrock. Guys like that, right? But the boxing community would have never heard the end of it if Francis Ngannou would have upset Tyson Fury, the Gypsy King, the, the heavyweight champion. That would have been something. And we came this close this close we came you know the discretion of the judges away from that actually happening going into the scorecards i did i thought tyson fury edged it by like a round right but it was really anybody's guess who won that fight so is tyson fury not nearly what he has been and was or is francis Ngannou a legitimate boxer i don't I don't have the answer to that just yet, but I know that Anthony Joshua was looking as good as ever. He had a very active 2023. He beat Jermaine Franklin via a decision. He beat Robert Hellenius via knockout. After having some difficulty in the early rounds and kind of having difficulty in the jab battle with Robert Hellenius, and then he dominated, then destroyed Otto Valin in December. So it was a very active 2023 for Anthony Joshua as Eddie Hearn said that it would be now he had a different fight trajectory in mind different schedule in mind he wanted it to be Jermaine Franklin then Dillian White that was supposed to be Anthony Joshua's second fight in 2023 the rematch between Joshua and White White tested positive for PEDs and to Robert Hellenius and then the idea is that the third fight was going to be Joshua versus Wilder but you know enter the Saudis the money that they're throwing at boxing kind of changes the configuration where it would make sense to have Wilder versus Parker on the same day as Joshua versus Valin. So then you could have that buildup where those respective fighters, those respective A-side fighters win their respective fights. Then you could set something up big for the first or second quarter of 2024. Well, they're not playing in terms of the timelines here because Anthony Joshua just fought in December 23rd and less than three months after that, he's going to be fighting Francis Ngannou. So it looks like the boxers are able to are willing to fight at the you know at the pace the scheduling pace of the Saudis. So 
when you hear promoters say, you know, well, it takes way, way longer than that to get a fight of this magnitude together. It's like, well, yeah, maybe if you don't have the money, you know what I mean? Yeah, these things will take time getting the getting the fight purses agreed upon, getting this agreed upon, location, site fees, all these different things to make these super fights. Yeah, maybe if you are of matchroom means or top rank, at least this version of top rank in today's game, maybe if you are of that stature or even PBC, yeah, big fights, mega fights, don't come together as quickly as if you are able to just throw money at boxing in the way that the Saudis have. In fact, I think that if Better Be If gets past Callum Smith, I'm holding out hope that we get Better Be If versus Dimitri Bivol, probably on the undercard of a major boxing event in Saudi Arabia. That's, that's what I see as being a real possibility here because otherwise, I don't know if Better Be If versus Bivol is able to get made through conventional promotional, you know, the, the current boxing business and boxing apparatus. I don't know if that could get better be a versus Bivol done. It might require Saudi involvement, but I'm going to ask the question again. How good of a chance does Francis Ngannou have against Anthony Joshua? Well, if you're just looking at the measurables, Joshua's listed at 6'6", Ngannou's listed at 6'4". I'm not totally buying it. I think that when we see them looking eye to eye, face to face, that they will be like within an inch of each other height wise, or even the same height. I think that in this case, Ngannou's height might be, is either slightly undervalued. I mean, you, you look at how he was looking at Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury's listed at 6'9". Are you buying that Fury is five inches taller than Francis Ngannou? I'm not. It looked more like a three inch height advantage. And Anthony Joshua, I think that him at 6'6 might slightly be over listed. So I think that it's going to look more like 6'5 against 6'5 when they're staring at each other and when they're in the ring together. Anthony Joshua has an 82 inch reach. Francis Ngannou has an 83 inch reach. So nearly the same reach as well. Both with pretty long reaches, obviously. Uh, Joshua is 34 years old and Ngannou is 37 years old. And that age, coupled with Ngannou's past like knee issue and knee surgery, told me that he was just going into a cash out fight against Fury. I didn't think he was going to be as mobile as he was. I didn't think that he was going to be able to use his legs to explode and, and even to control range in the way that he was. But his knee looked fine. You know what I mean? So if his knees are good, this could be somewhat interesting. Now, it shouldn't be. My early instinct is saying Joshua and Joshua via stoppage, probably mid-round, maybe even earlier than that. Maybe what we got was a, it gave us a warped perception of all of these guys' abilities and that, you know, Joshua versus Ngannou is going to be more of a reflection of where Francis Ngannou stands in the boxing game. You know what I mean? I think that this might be like a market correction of sorts after that that, that amazing night that we got between Fury and Ngannou. So that's what you have to expect is going to happen, right? Even though when I did a short video when the fight was announced, just a little one minute, and a lot of the comments that I got were very pro Ngannou, believing that Ngannou was going to beat Anthony Joshua. Now, I don't know if this was just, you know, hardcore MMA fans who don't, you know, value the sweet science of boxing and saw Fury versus Ngannou and thought, hey, Ngannou's going to knock out Anthony Joshua. Or if it was boxing fans who were looking at the same thing and saying, hey, no, I think that Ngannou matchups wise is going to match up well against Anthony Joshua. Now, I, I kind of expect Joshua to get off to a little bit of a tepid and reluctant somewhat, you know, measured start against Ngannou. Joshua should dominate the jab battle. Ngannou had a good jab against Fury, but not a, not a great jab, but what, look, way better of a jab than I thought he was going to be able to display against Fury. Ngannou really looks for that right hand, that straight right, that looping right, and he could change it up. He's got a couple different styles of right hands, but he also has a nice left hook. And if you remember, it was Joshua jumping into the pocket against Andy Ruiz in their first fight after dropping Andy Ruiz in the third round. Joshua went in for the kill, got clipped upside the side of the head by an Andy Ruiz left hook mid exchange. And it was that punch that got Joshua all wobbly and ready to hit the canvas. Changed his whole career, right? Well, Ngannou's got a pretty quick 
left hook. And he was timing Fury coming in. Fury got hit upside the head with the left hook. And that's what dropped Fury. So Joshua is going to have to be careful when he steps in to throw the right hand. Because Nganu will be looking to counter. I think Joshua should have the faster hands. but And the more fluid punches. I think that he could throw more punches. More crisp and clean punches. But again, he's got to be careful because Nganu exercised a lot of patience. He also changed levels, changed angles. He didn't look like a total novice out there is what I'm trying to say. And it didn't take for the knockdown to happen for you to realize that. You could look at the first two rounds between Fury and Nganu and say, wait a second, what, what, what am I seeing here? You know what I'm saying? It didn't take the knockdown. There were moments where Nganu took a step back to get out of, out of the way of Fury's right hand and then stepped back in to land a punch of his own. Like there was that type of technical acumen on display for Francis Nganu. And it should also be noted that Fury came in head over skis on that one. Within the first two seconds of that fight, Fury just came in, tried to blast Nganu with a looping, hard, wild, almost a haymaker of a right hand. But it was, it was a sharp right hand. Fury, when he wants to sit on his right, he could throw a drill of a right hand. And when I saw that in the first two seconds, I'm thinking, oh man, he's out here to hurt Francis. But eight rounds, or I'm sorry, 10 rounds later, it was like, who won the fight? So yeah, there's there are some variables here. But again, gut instinct. I think Joshua comes in, controls range with the jab, is able to pop Nganu repeatedly. Nganu, I think, is going to be looking for his spots to counter. The first couple rounds might be somewhat interesting. I expect Joshua to be in control by the third round and changing levels, maybe going to Nganu's body, although he's got to be careful. Nganu's got fast hands and devastating power. So I think that Joshua, what we're going to see is Joshua, I like using the term picking the lock, basically, you know, switching it up, going to the body with a nice right hand or even with a jab to the body. I don't think he's going to be throwing as many right hands as he was throwing against the last two southpaws that he fought, Otto Valin and Alexander Usyk in the two fights before that, or at least in the two fights before, you know, Hellenius and Jermaine Franklin. But I think that Anthony Joshua should be able to do a lot with his left hand here, with his lead hand. It should also be noted Nganu can switch stances and does often switch stances. But I, I just, so I believe that Joshua's class is supposed to shine through here. But I, I also do think he's going to be giving Nganu some respect. He can't just walk in and, and control the fight and assert himself in the same way that he did Otto Valin. Like, Otto Valin might be the professional boxer out of he and Francis, but Francis Ngannou, to me, it has just a lot more athleticism. He's got the faster hands. He's got more power. He's got better legs. He's got good movement. Like, Ngannou is a very, very good athlete, and he seems to be learning super quickly. And I remember Teddy Atlas saying before the Fury versus Ngannou fight that he was giving Ngannou a real chance because of his adaptability and his ability to learn things very quickly, pick up concepts and skills and be able to start applying them he i guess you know when they were training together those few times teddy atlas was really impressed by nganu's ability to absorb information and to start learning it so it's also possible that as good as nganu looked against fury that he could be building on that skill set like right now as we speak he could be getting better and better and we might even see a better version of francis nganu but I just feel like the way that the fight should play out should revert back to the to the paradigm, to the mean. This should go back to boxer versus novice boxer. But I'm going to stop short of completely counting Nganu out. Like, I'm humble enough to say, hey, Francis Nganu, based on what you showed me in the last fight, I'm not going to totally dismiss your chances here. But again, if I'm going to go with my gut, you've I've got to go Anthony Joshua. And I've got to go Joshua via stoppage of some sort it's just that you know Richard Dwyer had pointed out that it's not enough for Anthony Joshua to simply win the fight he's got to kind of restore the the reputation of boxing in a way there's a lot at stake and it's not fair and maybe it shouldn't be the case but Anthony Joshua in this fight has boxing on his shoulders on his back he's got to 
demonstrate that these skills take time to develop and that you can't just hop in the ring and become an, an elite or near elite boxer. But if Nganu makes this fight competitive, then damn. Like, Nganu, like, what's at stake here? Well, a lot's at stake for Anthony Joshua. If he loses this fight, then damn, uh, you know, his whole career has to be relooked. It's just one of those scenarios. Again, it's not fair, but it is what it is. If Nganu loses, I think it depends on how he loses. If he just gets smoked by Anthony Joshua and just dominated and then stopped, well, then you, it, the public's going to reassess and say, well, maybe that performance against Fury, as mind-blowing as it was, was a bit of a fluke. Like, Fury, you know, might have under-trained. I know Fury said he had a 12-week camp. I take a lot of what Fury says with a grain of salt. I'm sorry. I'm just not buying it. I didn't see a guy who was at his best training-wise in the ring with Francis Ngannou. I just didn't see it. I think that he took it a little bit lightly, but he's saying that he had a 12-week camp. So if Joshua blows Ngannou out, then it's like, okay, Ngannou is a novice boxer, and then you wonder who Ngannou is going to fight after that. Does he retire? Does he fight another boxer who's not Fury or Anthony Joshua? Does he fight Deontay Wilder? Does he fight another top contender? I don't expect him and didn't expect him after the Fury fight to fight somebody like a Zhili Zhang or even a Derek Jazora because I'm thinking, why do you want to run the risk of burning your hot hand? You could fight whoever you want right now. Why are you going to fight a non-famous, famous, famous boxing contender who's probably going to beat you? You know what I mean? So I thought that it had to be either, you know, Anthony Joshua or Deontay Wilder or a rematch with Tyson Fury, something like that. But if Ngannou gets blown out against Joshua, he's going to have to probably reassess or maybe then go back to the PFL if he still wants to compete in MMA after these two mega paydays against Fury and against Anthony Joshua. But yeah, right now, I think that Joshua is going to be able to control range and control the pacing of this fight. Like, say what you want about Anthony Joshua, but he's got a ton of experience. I mean, the guy has fought... Usyk twice. He's fought Dillian White, Kubrat Pulev, Joseph Parker, Alexander Povetkin. He fought Andy Ruiz twice. Yeah, Vladimir Klitschko. He has fought so many elite and near elite fighters that sometimes I think that his experience is taken for granted because of his reputation and people's like wantingness, willingness to psychoanalyze them and to think, okay, is he mentally fragile? Is he this or is he that? Look, Anthony Joshua, aside from fighting or not having fought Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder, aside from those two, he has more or less fought the who's who of the past generation or two. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think that Anthony Joshua's abilities and his experience are going to shine through against Nganu. I'll do, a, again, a full breakdown going into the fight, and I've got to think of how exactly he's going to do that because, again, he's going to have to show Nganu some level of respect. And Nganu did show a, a, a ton of poise he showed a great chin because he did get hit by Fury several times, not several times super flush, but he did get hit a good amount and he wore it well. So he's got a great chin, great power, great athleticism. And again, one of the things that struck me the most shockingly was his level of poise. And when Fury would do something and Ganu's ability to not turn into a novice fighter, right? He kept his poise, kept his patience, kept his defense kept his movement, kept his head movement, kept changing levels. He stayed measured, even when Fury tried to pour it on. But right now, my gut instinct is just going with the logic here. And I'm going with Anthony Joshua. Again, I'm, this might change as I further think about this matchup. But right now, I, I got to go Anthony Joshua via stoppage. Let me know your thoughts on Joshua versus Francis Ngannou in the comments. What do you think of this matchmaking? And by the way, Eddie Hearn is saying that after this Joshua versus Ngannou fight, if Joshua wins, of course, that he's going to have a, that they're going to aim for a vacant IBF title fight between Anthony Joshua and Philip Ergovich. And this, you know, depends on what happens with Fury versus Alexander Usyk and whether they have a rematch and things like that. Because if they have the rematch, it's not going to be for all the belts. One or more of those belts are going to be fragmented. So you've got Zhili Zhang, who's like the mandatory for the WBO. You've got Philippe, uh, Philippe or Philip Ergovich, who's the IBF mandatory. 
But if Anthony Joshua, you know, the way that he beat Otto Valin and if he beats Francis Ngannou, I'm sure that he's going to be fighting for uh, one of those vacant titles. But yeah, let me know what you think about this fight. Are, are you satisfied? Because a lot of people hate the idea that Anthony Joshua is basically burning a fight instead of fighting a Zhili Zhang, a Philippe Ergovich or somebody like that, that he's fighting Francis Ngannou. To me, it's not totally surprising. And again, they were. it seemed like they were going to make Anthony Joshua versus Deontay Wilder. It's not Anthony Joshua's fault that Wilder lost against Joseph Parker, but Anthony Joshua is fighting this quote unquote gimmick or novelty fight against Francis Ngannou. Are you displeased with that? I know that some of you are, but yeah, let me know what you think about the fight and what your expected outcome is. And what do you think about the heavyweight landscape as a whole? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, if you are into the fight talk, I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.